Welcome to Gavin with Gavin. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to, this is going to be episode number 12 of the Gavin with Gavin podcast. I have a uh, super special guest on the podcast today. Uh, this one's super exciting for me. He's an actor, a writer, a comedian, a director, and a musician. Um, you guys know him from Confessions of a Porn Addict, X-Rated, and of course, the uh, the legendary Kenny versus Spenny. I'm joined today by Spencer Rice. Thank you very much for joining us, man. You're welcome, Gavin. Let's get Gavin. Let, let's Gab. I'm, I'm excited, man. I really, uh, really grew up on your stuff. So this is, uh, this is an honor to have you on today. Awesome, buddy. Um, I want to start out with kind of, I think a lot of people, I've, I've familiarized myself a lot more um, knowing we were doing this with some of your work, but I think a lot of people know you mostly from, of course, Kenny versus Spenny. Yes. I want to ask you a question to kind of start out with that. Sure. For people who exclusively know you, their only exposure to you is from there. Yeah. What, what's something that people assume about you and is not true and then also something that um that is true about you that people who only know you from that would be surprised to find out um uh it's an interesting question uh you know i kind of lay it all out there uh one of my uh life rules is that uh you try to not lie as much as possible and be be at least creatively um i feel like if i'm being myself uh you know, I can't go too far off track. So as far as I, I guess some people don't know about me that I'm a musician, let's say, or that I was a, been a writer, um, the, the Kenny versus Spenny uh, uh, juggernaut, we'll call it, is, is a blessing and a curse. Absolutely, mostly a blessing. It's opened up a lot of doors for me. Uh, the curse is, and it's no different with anybody who's an actor who gets on a popular sitcom and uh, gets, you know, in a role like let's say Fonzie or something that becomes a breakout character. It is difficult to get out from under that. Now, on the one hand, you're lucky to have something to get out from under. On the other hand, um, it does make it difficult to uh, redefine yourself or, or put yourself as a creative person in another area. Uh, I feel like I have no choice. I, 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 I'm a compulsive person, so I'm, I'm compulsively creating one way or the other. And I just put my head down and I just do the, do the work, whether it's, you know, I've got a podcast tonight, you know, it may, or not a podcast, a live stream. And, you know, there might be 60 people, there might be 150 people, there might be 2000 people. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter to me. Of course, I want 2000 people. Uh, but having said that, you know, uh, that's, that's, uh, it's just what I'm doing. And, you know, there's a point where the economics don't make sense and then I'll stop doing it and move on. But I've always found that uh, people that survive with any kind of longevity in show business, uh, and there's so many different ways to do it nowadays, especially with the internet, um, they adapt, you know, and I have to adapt harder than most people because I'm lucky enough to be defined as, as this one person. So that's maybe what they don't know. Uh, and what was the other part of it? What do they know? And then what's something they kind of people who only see you on the show assume about you and maybe like want to talk to you in the store? What do you think about your, your, well, I, think, your I think I come across in the show as uh, uh, as very sort of pretentious and uh, maybe a little bit of an intellectual snob or something like that. Uh, again, uh, that might be true about me with the, you know, the one thing is I don't put, find myself particularly intelligent. I have uh, what I find a lot of people don't have these days, especially younger people. And I hate making generalizations, but an intellectual curiosity. So um, I'm not an intellectual, but I listen to intellectuals all the time, uh, either on YouTube or read their books or whatever. Uh, really, it's just another word for expertise in, in whatever thing. So, um, so I, I think that that would be something that, uh, you know, uh, I'm always going to come across as that if I'm trying to use my creativity to teach. 
anything. Uh, and uh, that's okay. I'll live with that. Very cool. Great. Uh, that's great. Um, you you kind of mentioned how the role of, um, was a bit of a blessing and a curse. Yes. And something that I've always been curious about is do people have a tough time, say fans, when they see you in the streets or anything, do they have a tough time separating Spencer Rice no, from Spencer? No, you know, of course there's been about, literally I could count them on one hand that I would call negative interactions with fans in real life. And it ran the gamut from some drunk guy at a bar at a Nickelback uh, <laughs> CD release party who just wouldn't stop screaming that I was a f- and uh, I was a millionaire. The whole thing didn't make sense. It was absurd. Uh, unfortunately, the guy I was with went into some kind of, uh, uh, I guess it's diabetic shock, and I couldn't leave because I would have have to have left him there. And he was from Los Angeles, and he wouldn't have known how to, you know. So I had to sit there and kind of take it. Uh, and I could have gotten this because I know the Nickelback guys, and they would have very gladly lent me one of their security monsters to uh in no, no uncertain terms, remove that guy from the room, but I didn't do it. I've had people just yell, you're a loser when I, you know, walking down the street. But other than that, and Gavin, this is the honest to God truth. I have no reason to lie about it. So many of the people that say the most malignant and horrible things to me, you're a no talent, you're a second banana, you suck, you're a f- like just ugly stuff. Uh, if I somehow push back with them, either through social media or whatever, uh, like 99% of the time, maybe 96% of the time, they're like, oh, I'm just kidding, Spenny. So there's this there's this uh, thing that people have because of Kenny versus Spenny where they channel Kenny uh, and they feel very comfortable because he was uh, so mean or whatever that they can do it too. And there are some people that genuinely don't like me. I mean, that just comes with the territory. I just, I'm, I'm a really, I don't give a fuck individual. You'll probably never meet one more like me. Uh, I just don't give a fuck what people think or say. I'm on my uh, mission to learn about life and try to, you know, put things together in my head and nothing will stop me from that. And also entertaining and being funny and being a jerk and all those things. So, you know, I really couldn't care less. In fact, it's, it's, it's actually has the opposite effect. The, the more pushback I get, the more excited I get to go back out there and do it again. So it's kind of twisted, I guess, but that's what it is for me. That's uh, I, I'm very excited. I owe you a, uh, a thank you, by the way. I think the last, uh, last event that I attended before everything shut down was your, your live show. So we, and we had a, a great time there. So hopefully Where everything opens. Kingston? Oshawa. Oshawa. Okay. Yeah. yeah yuck, yuck yucks. Yeah. 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 yeah a ton of fun. Um, I, I'm going to jump around here just now that we touched Whatever on you. Whatever you want to talk about, I'm here. You, um, you did a movie with Mark Breslin. Yes. Confessions of a Porn Addict. Yes. Um, you were the creator, writer, director, star. What was that? No, I, it, didn't, I didn't direct it. it oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Producer. By, uh, a very yes. close friend of mine named uh, Duncan Christie, who was one of the editors uh, and very talented guy. He was one of the editors on uh, uh, Kenny versus Spenny. And... Um, uh, so he directed it, but uh, yeah, I, 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 I kind of came up with the concept Duncan and I kind of worked on, it was an improvised project basically with a, you know, a pretty detailed outline and we went out and shot it. I mean, there's something that people don't really know about that movie and I get a lot of good feedback or I should say a little feedback because so few people have seen it, but positive feedback. Cause I think it's great for a low budget uh, Canadian, uh, you know, mock doc. I'm kind of proud of it. You know, I'd watched so much porn that I became immune to it, essentially. And, you know, just like a heroin addict, you know, I needed stronger stuff. I I very much enjoyed it. And I I think it is something you should be proud of. I I thought you and uh, Mark had awesome chemistry and... Well, Mark, Mark, so you know, Mark, Mark, you mentioned Yuck Yucks. Of course, that's his comedy chain. Uh, Mark and I go back to when I was a kid and he had just opened Yuck Yucks in Toronto And my cousin Marjorie, who's sort of my hero and my muse, who passed away a long time ago, she was like one of the first stand up comedians in Canada. So she uh, I used to hang out with Mark when I was super, super young. And uh, in a way, and I think Kenny would say this, he's sort of our comedy godfather in the sense, you know, so uh, we just love him to bits. That's awesome. I think of you guys as, you know, Canadian comedy legends and he's a a Canadian comedy icon. So that's very cool to hear that. You you know that you've known him for, and, and by the way, he was so good in that movie. Uh, 
and I, I didn't expect him not to be good, by the way, but I didn't expect him to take it absolutely as seriously as he did. I mean, he was paid, but not a whole lot of money. It's a Canadian production. And I just think he really liked the story. I think mm-hmm. he likes uh, that area of deviant sex, which was sort of what his character was. And he just hit it out of the park. And I just think without him, that film would have been pretty flat, I think. I do. Uh, I really enjoyed just you, the, your interactions together. I, there was a scene where um, you guys are in the hotel together and he's asking yeah. you to be a better roommate, very like passive aggressively. Yes. Just, well, yeah, just, he had, I had the cock cage on and I wasn't yes. seeing straight. Yep. So he was upset about that. Yeah. He's just, you know, I mean, this is a guy, his, his, his knowledge of pop culture, especially in movies, not so much TV and certainly in stand up comedy is unparalleled. I mean, the guy, mm-hmm. He's worked with, knows everybody. He's, you know, he worked on the Joan River show when she had her talk show. He's been everywhere and done everything in the business pretty much. And uh, just a great guy. Um, with, we touched on like YouTube and all the sort of things that are that out there today. There's so many <laughs> videos like, you know, gross out, humiliation, things like that. Why do you think Kenny versus Spenny has had the longevity and what, what kind of separates it from things that are like it? Well, the real a couple of things. Well, first of all, I don't know that it would be uh, something anyone would put on the air nowadays with the cancel culture. I don't know. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm dead set against the cancel culture. Uh, and we could talk about that. I have that written uh, down in my questions, actually. Yeah. Um, what was the question again? It was. Um, what do you think like, to the fans that's given you such a like a cult following makes it stand oh, out from oh, similar I, I kind think, of. I, honestly, I think that it's real. Uh, in the sense that we really are those guys, we're not acting and I don't know if they process it, but, uh, you know, Kenny's funny as shit. And he, he, he plays to that sort of lowest common denominator that people really like. And my comedic, uh, thing is more sort of in the Woody Allen, Larry David vein, neurotic, uh, uh, kind of humor. So it just kind of works. But I think when you add that layer of, of that, that, that we weren't two guys thrown together by a television show to do a television show that we actually were friends uh, for decades before we ever got on TV. I think that sort of shows through in our timing, which is completely unconscious for us because we've, we've been doing it. And, and by the way, before we had a show, we were always contentious buddies. You know, we, you know, Kenny's, uh, and I, I think he would say the same thing about me. He's a very difficult person uh, to deal with on many levels, a wonderful person and a very good friend of mine. And I think he would say the same thing about me. Um, so it's a, it's a mix of those things. And we're hot, hot Jewish men, you know, the ladies <laughs> yep. like that. And uh, it's stupid. You know, I mean, really, at the end of the day, I can't think of much thing more stupid, which isn't to say there isn't aspects of it that are smart. But, you know, watching two guys compete to see who can keep a shit in their diaper the longest is, you know, pushing the envelope of completely stupid. But it just it just it's just a right mix of uh, comedic chemistry, um, jackass kind of, you know, stupidity stunts. And then we're sort of telling a story at the same time. And, you know, and I think people can identify with one of the two of us, which hooks them in. And uh I mean, that's really my only insights into that is just, uh, and I think we do it well. I mean, to our credit, I think, you know, we are comedy geeks, right? And we grew up loving comedy. So, you know, it was a comedy show at the end of the day. It was a reality comedy show. So I, I, I think we we knew how to, you know, learn from the Andy Kaufmans, the Laurel and Hardys, the, you know, you could go on and on and on, the Marx Brothers. And it all just sort of is a big confluence that is Kenny versus Spenny. Very cool. You 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 did talk about, and let, let's jump into it here. You guys are a show that was pre-internet. People wanted to cancel. I remember. I, re, I remember paper articles. There, you, you guys have. A, there's always uh, been kind of been pre-internet. It was not. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm I'm talking pre-Twitter. That that kind of slipped from. Oh, okay. Social media. Maybe exactly. Not. Before everything was kind of before the, right. the, whole, the whole cancel culture era. You're right. Um, there's always kind of been controversy around your show and. Yeah. Um, what do you think about everything going on right now? Well, for, I think our show is, is, you know, I think Kenny's behavior, and this isn't a comment on him as a person, but his behavior on the show is, you know, not something you would necessarily want your children to, you know, uh, be like. Come on, fuck you. There's no way you can compete with me, Spencer Nolan Rice. 
I'm a meat-eating machine, I'm a meat factory, and you are not safe. And that was, you know, that's kind of who he is, and he has fun with it. You know, that's not his total personality. Um, uh, I'm sorry, question again? I don't know, no problem, man. My wife's like vacuuming she picked out she knows i'm doing this so she's upstairs back hey, anyway, not, not a problem at all I, I was just wanted to get your opinions on cancel culture being from a show oh, yeah, with so much controversy so, so so well my feelings are that so much uh is misplaced and un, unthought through by people mm -hmm. and i think that be, and this is where i sound pretentious but i think it's because people are intellectually lazy and they don't read and they don't learn history and they don't you know, the cherry pick wisdom. They, they, mm -hmm. they seem to want to go on one, one, one uh, idea or one person and then ride all the way with that, which is absurd. Uh, there's so much truth out there in different forms and, and so many things that make sense. So uh, I, I think with cancer, cancel culture, it, it fundamentally does boil down to intent. Yeah. Um, and if you want to get offended, uh that's you're right and this is where things are right now but i would like to see people become a little bit more discerning about the intent you know it, like kenny has done some things on our shows particularly that didn't make the cut or we've shown in the live show that you know are uns or, or let's just use me as an example i wore the ku klux klan outfit in, in in one of the episodes uh you know, but there was a context to it, which I think was, you know, I was at a, a fucking racial retreat to try to understand where all this hatred and animosity could come from. But people don't want context, right? They want canceled Kenny versus Spenny. He wore a yep. plan outfit suit. And I think that that's really important, you know, and I, the other thing is I think people need to be a little tougher, especially with social media, you know, um, and, and some things deserve canceled. You yes, know, but, absolutely. but you know, the, I don't think that does. I think if Kenny or if I wore a Ku Klux Klan outfit, you look at the totality of the show. By the way, I, if, if I was a, a racist or Kenny was a racist or a homophobe, we wouldn't be friends. We wouldn't be doing the show, you know. So I think for comedy in particular, it's it's kind of depressing. Uh, I know Jerry Seinfeld, who's commonly known as one of the cleanest stand up comics that ever lived. He hmm. stopped touring. Uh, on university call, yeah, campuses yeah. because of all that and and we've had a bit of it uh over the years uh you know i had i was doing sex toy bingo which had a lot of very you know blue jokes and you know jokes that were maybe at the expense of let's say transgendered people but very light like a joke like uh you know uh, how did uh you know john celebrate his uh sex change operation well he ate drank he he went to eat and drink and be merry, you know, be <laughs> merry, yep. M-A-R-Y. And, 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 you know, that's just so harmless to me. And it's so obvious that I'm, I'm an it's, inclusive person. But yes. the reality is, Gavin, is, is there are people who hate Jews who will never change. And, and I think that the whole idea of a rule of law is to, you know, is to, if they, they have the right to think what they think, mm -hmm. I have the right to say, I don't like the way you think. I can't stop them from thinking that way. And if I try to, I'll probably make them worse. Uh, so I, you just have to suck it up. Now, if they go break a law and burn down a synagogue or, you know, or lynch somebody, God forbid, that's breaking the law. Yes. Then they go to prison. Yeah. And I think that's the line. I think it's just that simple that, that we have to tough it up. It's not the direction we're going, it seems. Uh, and I think people have good intentions in, ca in cancel culture. Uh, but you know, I mean, look at Louis C.K., for example, that's Louis C.K. has now sort of when you think of him, you're thinking of Weinstein and you're thinking of maybe uh, Michael Richards. Well, the, the difference I, from um, Louis to a, like a Bill Cosby, like you're touching on, is it's incredible. Right. One one should be canceled. One you should really look at and see what, you know. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, he masturbated in front of uh, women in his hotel room. Yeah. Uh, OK, you know. Yeah. I don't know if I do that, but he did that, and you know. But for, but then they become equated. It, it's very much if you ever saw a movie called Capturing the Freedmans, which was about a pedophile case and a, a man that was accused of uh, of being a pedophile, and they did home videos during that whole period. And the hysteria, the understandable hysteria around pedophilia, is is certainly understandable. But it, it, it turns into something that's not rational, that it's it's it, it, it becomes its own 
hysteria. It's like burning the Beatle records, you know, back in the early 60s, you know, and it's not human beings, uh, usually their best uh, foot forward, you know, because uh, we're intelligent creatures and, and we should be able to discern and, and you know, make a difference between a Cosby and a Louis C.K. or a Kenny and Spenny and uh, a Weinstein or whatever. Yes. But, you know, I think, yeah, if you don't, if you're if you're offended and the person hasn't broken any law, don't watch them anymore. That's it. Don't. Yeah. Yeah. You can you can take some time. And if you don't like the comedian on stage, go outside and come back. And yeah, people need to tough it up a little. I do agree with you on that. And, and you know, and I think and I think I, I'm I'm from I'm, I'm a, like a, a end of the road boomer, like the last year of the of the baby boom. And, you know, I when I was growing up, I mean, I think I did things when it came to women or nothing terribly malignant that I wouldn't do now. And I think that part of growing up and uh, is owning your stuff and not denying it. So, uh, you know, had I it, had I been inappropriate with women, maybe a few times, probably uh, anything that I'm grossly ashamed of. No, but is it something that I'm going to uh, pretend didn't happen or whatever? No, I, I think we'll, we're always better as the people when we're, we can talk about things and, and reason with each other rather than just knee-jerk react to everything. Yes. Yeah, like you were saying, intent is what... And then the, you do get knee-jerk reactions where, um, like, the consequences aren't suit like suitable for what the person Well, look did. at Don Rickles. There's my, one of my great examples. I mean, Don Rickles, arguably one of my favorite comedians of all time, yep. and he used to get out on stage and rip everybody, Japanese, blacks, Jews, women. And Milton, my idol. Still here, Milt. Wonderful guy. 65 years in the business, huh? 65 years in show business and you don't want to walk away. It's all over, Milton. Grab a cab. <laughs> Fat people. And, you know, I loved it. And I'd be disingenuous to say I love Dice Clay. Yes. Uh, they made me laugh. I didn't get the feeling that they that those people, when they were off stage were nasty people. Uh, and that helped me, you know, like them. And, and uh, I think people should be given that kind of benefit of the doubt, provided they haven't broken a law. Mm -hmm. There is kind of, there's got to be some sort of separation too, between art and the person, right? Especially when you're talking about dice or somebody like. That's a very interesting, very interesting uh, question because, you know, my great example is the fellow right there with, uh, with his naked wife, uh, John Lennon, you know, the more you read about John Lennon, um, yes. he had some issues, yes. you know, uh, same with Jimi Hendrix, uh, same with a number of, 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 of uh, especially in the rock and roll years, the you Stones, know, yeah, womanizing, violence, all kinds of stuff. And does that, you know, make their work any less good or bad? In my opinion, no. Phil Spector is a piece of shit. He was convicted. But he's a great producer. I was listening to, uh, you know, the Ronettes yesterday, the great wall of sound. And what you're talking about is very smart. It's the separating of, uh, I mean, Woody Allen is like That's maybe one of my all-time heroes. Who knows what he did? There's strong arguments both ways. Uh, at the end of the day, as someone who doesn't know him personally, but likes to watch his movies, read his books, I like Woody Allen. That doesn't mean I'm pro pedophilia, <laughs> you know. It's a, yeah. But that's the that that's the stupidity of this world we live in. It's guilt by association, and I think it's yes, fun, that's a great way of putting it. it it's fu it's fundamentally we just live in an attack culture. Yes, and and the, and uh, social media just nothing could be more perfect because you can yes. be anonymous and be as mean in as you instant, want. Instant, yes, yeah, you know. So it's actually, in my opinion, kind of cowardly. But worse than that, it's just. It just doesn't move anybody forward. It yes. just, we're living in a time right now that, and I'm pretty politically aware. I'm, I'm you know, I, I, I do read books and, you know, I'm definitely not a genius, but, uh, you know, this is a very, we're, it's like the pendulum is swinging back from enlightenment, you know, and that's what the sort of Trump era was and Marjorie Taylor Green. And I mean, it's shocking. And, and then some people say, you know, well, you know, Spenny, you're just feeding into it by being nasty to these people. I know that's uh, my friend told me that's what Bill Maher's take on it is. You know, you can't call them all idiots. Well, I disagree with Mr. Maher, who I respect. Uh, I don't know what else you can do when someone compares uh, wearing a mask to the Holocaust. I'm, 
I'm supposed to not say you're a fucking moron and I hate you for saying that. I can't do it. And, and you know, and, and I might be wrong. And that's the other thing. The humility is so missing, I find. I was going to say, I think that's a huge thing that people aren't able to do now is if, if me and you have a different opinion, there's no talking. There's just you're an idiot for thinking this. And, right. you know, there's no, there's no I, conversation. You'll find with me, I'm, I am literally, and I'm not just saying this, I live to be proven wrong. I, 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 you know, because that means I've learned something. I've made a growth, you know, and uh, I'm always open to it. But with a lot of the Trumpers and I, you know, I really want to get past them, uh, but they're not about that. Yeah. They're certainly not about that. They're, they're, they're just, uh, I mean, I know exactly what that is. If you want to talk about it, that's at least my theory of it, what it all comes from, what, what the underlying principle is. And it's not just Trump. It's, it goes back to, uh, you know, basically slavery. Uh, but anyways, that's another discussion. Um, yeah, it's just very, uh, it's just rough and tumble out there. Yeah. And I, I'm just tough. Like I, you know, I, I've had people threaten my life over this Trump stuff. And, you know, I've had people say my, they want to see my daughter die of uh, COVID, Jesus. like, you know, really, really horrible shit. But, you know, just, that's not illegal to say that. So I got to live with it. As these people are talking about how tolerant they are, telling you all these terrible things. Well, it, you know, in fairness, I, I, I come at them very aggressively, you know, so I, I, you know, that's okay. I can handle it, man. You yeah. know, like, you know, I, you know, I worry about the kids that can handle it, you know, that aren't my age, that aren't, you know, as sure of themselves. You hear about these kids that are bullied for being overweight or homosexual and they kill themselves. You know, that's a very sad thing. Uh, I want to see a tougher, you know, I want to see a society where, you know, they, that, is, you know, anybody that's going to uh, tease someone for being overweight or gay, let's say, that they really have a problem, not the not the person yes. that's overweight. And I mean, it's just the truth, because, you know, I, I have a, a social media page. Right. And and, you know, as you know, I'm sure people it can be very nasty to me in social media. I couldn't give a shit. But, you know, the reality is, I think to myself, there's a lot of entertainers that I don't like, not personally, but I don't like their music or I don't like this or that, or I don't think they're very funny. I couldn't for the life of me imagine going onto their social media site to tell them how shitty I think they are. I just, that's just me. Maybe that is a boomer generation thing. I have no idea. To me, it's just, you know, common decency, you know, and an understanding that a lot of the artists I may not like have a thousand million more followers than I do. And are getting, are more famous than I am and richer than than I am. So it's not you know, it, it, you know if anything we'll say there's just different tastes. Everybody has different tastes. And that was a when I was a kid, if you didn't like the Beatles or the Marx Brothers, I thought you were a moron, which was wrong. And I've changed. That's part Actually, of growing up and maturing for sure. Yeah, you know, you become hopefully less tribal because this whole tribal word, it's for me, it's a buzzword for so many things. <laughs> We get tribal about our politics. We get tribal about what we like in show business, you know, and it's just, it's just this closed sort of way of looking at the world. And uh, I don't think it's, it's good for growth, but that's the way you are when you're young. And I think as adults, we've got to, you know, I, I was different. Like I, I loved all my dad's music. Like I, I invaded his record collection. So, you know, I shouldn't buy, you know, by nature be a Frank Sinatra fan, you know, cause I'm more of the, you know, stones Beatles guy, but mm-hmm. I can see, and I knew at an early age, this is just good music. Yeah. Period. I yeah. like it. Now it doesn't mean everybody likes Frank Sinatra. I did. And I didn't feel, you know, that I had to shit on Frank because he was a different generation, you know? And also art is just so subjective. Like you just, totally. people can, t- people can like Frank or not, and they can still have good taste in art or, yeah, it's it's crazy. I, I one thing you it's touched the difference on, between saying for me it's always say, I don't care for Frank Sinatra or it's not my thing to oh he sucks. Th- th- there, know? that's perfect. Metallica is better. You know, yep. it's just like it's just different, and it's yep. just you don't have to like everybody. It's okay not to say eh, it's not my thing. Definitely. One thing um, you mentioned there was like people you know being mean on social media and that just something I've always thought is people who are like you know happy and have a lot going on aren't spending all day on your wall send a message about how you suck and they don't like you. So that's, that it's, that is telling, like you were saying, that does kind of let you know a lot about those kind of people. And it's not surprising. You know, I always talk about reading and my reading has fallen 
by the wayside since I have kids and, you know, there's just not that much time, but there's so many things uh, to, uh, to take its place vis-a-vis, you know, learning about anything on, on a YouTube uh, lecture, university lecture, there's just tons of shit there. So it's really this, this lack of curiosity, this, this idea, this, that we know everything somehow and nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, we are fucking up the environment. We are still warring with each other over, you know, religious things. I mean, you know, and all kinds of things that, you know, so we're not living in peace with each other. Uh, you know, maybe I'm a bit Pollyanna, but I know we can do a lot better than this. I just, you know, and it may never happen. Uh, you know, it just takes a little bit of humility and empathy and uh, not thinking you're right about everything and that, you know, yep. things <laughs> uh, things can can change and you can change and we're all stuck here together kind of thing. That's where, that's what I think, you know, I I do want to ask you more about your work here, but let me ask you one, one more question on this topic. Yes. Do you think that social media has made it better or worse for people coming together? And Um, I think it's worse, but that's not the, it's not the social media's fault. That's like blaming cars for drunk drivers. You know, it's a tremendous technology. What we're doing uh, is incredible. I mean, you know, like, you're doing this show and you're creating it yourself and you got me on it and whatever, like that's, that's an amazing thing. The fact that I can Google anything that I want and, you know, pretty much, you know, be guaranteed a a relatively uh, true, true answer is remarkable. Um, There's so many things remarkable about it, but you know, if if people are going to misuse the technology, in my opinion, it's not the technology's fault. That's a yeah, that's a great answer. Like you, you can learn any skill. You can find any information, and people are using it to tell you they don't like you. Yeah, hey, that and, seems and, crazy. and you know, and it, and it's just like, where's the you know? I I just so I, maybe I don't think I'm that different. I, but you know, like yesterday, I went on a walk and I put on my uh, a YouTube video and I listened to uh, a, a whole thirty minute lecture on Spinoza, the philosopher from the 17th century. Okay, it, it doesn't have to be that, but you know. Why did I listen to that? Because I didn't know enough about him. And I know he's got a great reputation. It's just that simple. You either have that desire or you don't. And and reading, I, I meant to say this before, you know, reading is a muscle, right? You you don't use it and everybody's on their phones and everything. You're, you're not, they're not going to start reading later in life. They're just not. I can promise you that. I mean, some will, obviously, there's always exceptions, but it's a muscle. It has to be worked. Uh, it's, it's, it's very good for your brain. And of course, the greatest thing about books is the amount of detail. Yes. There's no time, time limit. You know, you don't have to do it in sound bites. You can read a, a massive book on a very interesting topic and get a whole ton of information. Uh, so my hope is that, you know, that, that people start to use the internet like encyclopedias were used or, or, or books to learn. You know, yep. but if you think you're right about everything, then you're never going to want to learn. So that's really the problem. You got to be humble. Like, yep. come on, there's so much to learn. Yep. There's so much to learn. You know, oh, yeah. You, six lifetimes, you'll never put a dent in how much there is out there to learn. Of course. Right. Yeah. Even if you've got a, a master skill in one thing, you don't ton, tons of stuff you have no information about. Absolutely. Let me uh, let me fire some uh, some Kenny and Spenny questions at you real quick. Sure. Just to get some quick sure. answers. Um What's your, do you have a favorite and a least favorite competition that you guys competed in? Yeah. But well, I, I didn't like doing almost any of them. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, yep. I guess my favorite one to do was the wrestling one because I'm a wrestling fan. As they size each other up, we have the nice guy offering a handshake, but Tyson wants nothing to do with it. He's all business in the ring and the nice guy's just trying to be nice. Uh, you know, I got to cut myself, which was, uh, or at least Tyson cut me, which goes back to old wrestling real blood days he's chopped. now he's busting him up devastating blows and what's that i see something here something fishy's going on here here tyson maybe having a foreign object in his hand oh he's busted open uh so that was sort of a fantasy episode and then the worst one for me would, would have been the 69 position uh, just to be i'm not a huggy feely person you know so to be strapped to that hairy beast with his farting and his yeah, body odor, which he purposely, you know, you know, made sure he smelled really nasty for that episode. Cause of course he wanted me to, to win, to lose the episode. But um, oh. yeah, that was the worst one for me. Ow! Kenny! Kenny, no! Ah! What's your name? Ah! 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 
How was it uh, meeting the Sheik in the wrestling episode? You know, um, always, always a thrill to meet wrestlers, and I've got to meet uh, quite a few of them. Uh, also sad because of his uh, physical condition, uh, you know, the yeah. years of wrestling. And, and uh, you know, I'm not so sure mentally he was in a good place. But, you know, I respect him. Um, he was very nice to me, except when he, you know, when he wasn't trying to <laughs> shove a beer bottle up my ass. Oh, no, Penny, baby, don't get a smart with me. Mr. Even Hogan is a f- but I sold out Madison Square Garden in New York. You not ready to you sold out. It was, it was good. It was good meeting him. I love meeting wrestlers. I, I, I tend to meet them at comic conventions. The I do those uh, occasionally, and, and uh, I, I, I sat once the whole weekend beside Jake the Snake. Oh, very cool. Yeah, and we went out for, well, he was sober at the time, but we went out for uh, a drink together one night. It was it just, uh, they're interesting people, and they're all, all, honestly wrestling more than music was sort of my inroad into entertainment. Oh, that's very so, cool. Uh, I've always loved wrestling and will continue to love it. Not thrilled with the product right now but it's obviously a great product because yep. people love it it's just as i said it's not my thing anymore that's all that's did you used to go to the old um, maple leaf garden shows yes oh very cool man my it's funny my dad talks about those all the time sunday night yeah yeah that's... you know i was uh you know my favorite wrestler anybody asks i'll say it till the day i die was uh ed Fairhat, the the original sheik you could talk to your dad about him if he went to the gardens uh and this is even before the sort of uh, WWE uh, cartoon era, WWF back then. I used to go as a very young guy and see Ernie Ladd and Pimpero Furpo oh, and cool. the Flying Kangaroos and, you know, the, the Sheik and, and, and managers were there, you know, Bobby Heenan and Abdullah Farouk. And, you know, it was uh, and for a child who, you know, I, what my cousin used to take me and he didn't let me know. And this was what the kayfabe days. So he didn't let me know it was a, a work. And I was absolutely frightened to death of Abdullah the Butcher. Oh. And, you know, I thought they were real people. And uh, well, they're certainly real people, but I thought their characters, their personas were actually who they were. And that just gave it a whole degree of horror, which as a kid, you just love it, right? Mm -hmm. You just you live to be scared and, you know, the blood, everything. Yeah, it was great. Well, that's awesome. I had no idea you were such a big wrestling fan, man. That's cool to cool to touch on. Yeah. Um, were there any episodes that you guys couldn't air or anything that didn't get approved? Anything? Uh, like Kenny would pitch me one, like uh, let's do who can who can get slapped by more women, <laughs> and probably would have been hilarious, but I didn't want to do it. Um, uh, the network they tended to. Uh, interfere when Kenny would do something with Hitler or something that had nothing to do with anything, but was hilarious on its own. They felt that if you're going to do that, then it has to organically come from the competition that you're doing. So they, he got away with it in the theater one. I think it was who could put a better play on and he did some stupid, it wasn't even a play. It was shot in different location. Anyways, I hate arguing about, you know, the, the injustices of that fucking train wreck show. There were injustices, and and that's oh, many. my uh, my unofficial numbers here. Your record on the show twenty one fifty nine and five. It, yeah, it, but I don't think that's uh, accurate. Uh, it was all. it was Wikipedia, so it, it was a little a little, no, a little was sketchy. That the, was that the Wikipedia? Because there's a Wikipedia page that uh, when Kenny, not when he outsmarts me, but when he out and out cheats, mm -hmm. they reward the victory to me. And then Kenny, when you do the full count, still beats me, but by very little. It's just a, a shame. A lot closer, yeah. And, uh, you know, again, I feel so stupid uh, talking. or And still, we still fight about it. I, well, Kenny and I will talk about it. And he'll say, I should have won that beauty pageant. <laughs> it's so pathetic. I can't Oh, that's tell you. hilarious. This will be the deciding vote right here. Because it also is Mr. Spenny. Oh! But uh, I think it's much closer. So, you know, when he takes the octopus off his head, whether I know it or not, I'm sure he would argue that if it was me that did it, that I'd lost. You know, I just, you know, he's like a Trump in that way. You know, he's he's very into uh, hanging on to uh, 
intellectual concepts that are good for him and not really paying attention to true concepts that uh, aren't good for him. And he knows how to say, oh, it's just a stupid show anyways. I didn't care. Oh, really, Kenny? It's such a stupid show. Then why did you, you know, have a fucking meltdown hissy fit when I won the beauty pageant or something? You know, he he plays this thing where he he's the one that doesn't care and I care. And I just I, I just think that's such a load of bullshit. Nobody doesn't care as much as I do. Yes, I cared about, you know, trying to do the competition and winning, of course. But when it comes to what people think of me or versus he cares so much about his image, he cares so much. And he just he must think that's uncool. So he always minimizes it that I'm the guy who cares and he doesn't. It's absurd, but people fall for it. Kenny's a good con man. He really is. With the, uh, the the reality of the show, you're filming on location in so many places. Did you guys, I, I, I mean, there's clips that make it into the show where people have put their hands on you. Um, there's the police have been, is there any crazy stories that kind of stand out? Maybe we didn't see or. Uh, oh God. Um, so long ago. Uh, I, you know, I, I, there's a lot of them. I just, nothing comes to mind, you know, just, just, it was such a crazy show. I mean, you can imagine like, you know, being on acid uh, with an octopus on your head and then all of a sudden the show's over and everybody goes home and you're still buzzed and you can't get the smell of octopus off you. And then I go home and I get like 30 cans of tomato juice and try to wash it off in the bathtub and it won't wash off. Okay, this is the worst experience of my life right now. Just stuff like that, you know, it, nothing, nothing comes to mind, though. I'm sure there's about a million things where, you know, there was violence or almost violence and it's just what it was. Yeah, it, it's so unpredictable, right? When you're in that live environment, that's the, what a, it. Let me ask you this. If you could give yourself any advice, go back and talk to yourself on episode one. What would you tell young Spenny? about the competitions and the show? I, I would uh, I would say eat less salt because my face bloats a lot when I eat salt and I'm vain. Um, other than that, I think I did my job beautifully. You know, I, mm -hmm. I, I think my, my job was to do what I would do in any competition, you know, which would consult experts, figure out a, a strategy and then execute the strategy. It wasn't rocket science from, I didn't have to think about ways to cheat and all these things that Kenny spent his time on. And, and there wouldn't have been a show if I was completely in a defensive mode, worrying about what he was going to mm -hmm. do. That wouldn't have been good for the show. So um, it was a very simple task I was laid with. The, the complication was that he was going to do something. I didn't know what and when because I had uh, we created a production model where that I would never know what he was going to do, where my my crew would know what he was going to do. But I didn't know. And that was the only way we could keep it real, which I think is another thing the fans uh, maybe subconsciously see and appreciate, you know, they can tell that there's some, yes. that it's not scripted. Although I get that question all the time and it, it blows my mind, but people, some people still think it's scripted, but whatever. No, I do think it's um, one of the big factors for why the show is so beloved is the authenticity, the way you guys really are yourselves and the way you guys play off each other. It, it, the show wouldn't have worked if if there was two if it was two Kenny personalities, the show right. wouldn't have worked. So it's funny you mentioned that because when we did the original pilot in the States for USA Network and we were about halfway through the pilot and we're getting all these notes from fucking executives who, who, who thought it was like spy versus spy, which is a reference to an old mad magazine, magazine thing. Yep. so like if kenny had three dobermans to attack me i'd have to come back with four and it, it just wasn't what we were doing and that might have been a great show too but it wasn't who we were so um it was about a guy who you know it, you know what mark breslin bringing it all back to a full circle in a sense you know he, he when he we pitched him on it right before we did our first our first show i think it was the sleep episode we just wanted to get his sort of we had a meeting with him and he came over and we chatted and he loved it because he thought that ultimately the show would teach people the dark but true lesson that treating actually works, <laughs> that, that uh, bad behavior is is uh, can work, you know, and and that he sort of has a very, I would guess, cynical sense of humor and dark sense of humor, Mark Breslin. So he loved that about the show that, oh, Spanny, you're just going to get 
just <laughs> destroyed every episode and people are going to like it because, you know, uh, in another culture, in another time, they would have hated it. I mean, one of my favorite stories when we sold the, uh, the format rights to many countries, one of them was Colombia and the Colombian culture was, you know, the old school, good guys win, you know, good guys have to win and bad guys have to suffer. So they were completely confused by, you know, how, how, how it was okay for Candy to cheat, how it was okay for me to get quashed for not doing anything bad. But, you know, that's a cultural thing. Yep. Yeah, it is funny to think over there he'd be the bad guy. Who? Kenny. He is the bad guy. I, 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 yep, absolutely. You got, um, let me, uh, I know I know you got some stuff going on tonight. You've got the uh, the great yeah. unblocking coming up. i got up. about 10 minutes and then I got to scram. Yeah, no problem. I got um, just a couple of the rundown with you here. Sure. Um, I'd like to hear about some some new projects you got going on. I know Sex with Spenny's coming out. Yeah, that's that. I'm excited about that, and that's going to be a little you know show done in this little studio basement of mine. I've got a green screen if you can see up there hanging, and uh, it's really a, a column that I used to write uh, for the Windsor Independent, uh, and it was a it's a comedy piece uh, because you know I really shouldn't be advising anybody about sex. And, uh, but yet I do, and I make it funny, I think. And, uh, and I do have strong opinions, uh, that doesn't uh, necessarily mean I'm a sex God, but I, I, you can, you can know about things without uh, necessarily being particularly uh, good at it. And, but again, the, the overall goal is, uh, interactivity with people talking about the, it's sex with Sue with Spenny basically is what it is. Uh, you know, where Sue's a credentialed sex therapist, I'm not. So uh, we have fun with that. Um, you know, we're waiting for uh, things to open up. Uh, yeah. Kenny and I are going to uh, probably tour again. Uh, I'm going to, I can't wait to start playing music again. It's been a long time, bro. Yes, absolutely. And, um, you know, I'm out there, I'm pushing, trying to make money with this stuff. And, you know, people are saying, that's, you know, uh, yes, it's true. I'm trying to make money off of you people. Yes, it's true. I have no problem admitting that. I don't know why I, every other entertainer does it, but for some reason they pick on me. It's, it's mind boggling, but okay. Maybe I'm not good at it. Maybe I'm not good at, maybe I come across as greasy and whatever, but um, I'm just learning how to use all this stuff. How, you, you know, John got me the YouTube channel going and um, you know, I'm just learning how to actually monetize, you know, this is a pretty ideal thing. If you could actually, you know, I made some good money with it so far, like, you know, the Zoom calls, yep. all these things. It's uh, I never tried to do it before. I'm, I can kind of kick myself because I thought it would have made a lot of money probably if I started 10 years ago. It is great to see during like such a weird time. You're an entertainer. You're a performer, a traveler. It's awesome to see that, you know, you are adapting and making things happen. Well, that's what I said. You know, the, the, that is, it doesn't guarantee success, but if you don't adapt, it guarantees failure, right? Mm -hmm. So you look at the comedy history, there was vaudeville, which was a circuit for live shows, comedy music shows uh, all around the United States. And then radio happened and all the vaudeville performers fell by the wayside, except for the ones that were smart and moved over to radio. And then television happens and the same ones moved over to TV like Jack Benny and Bob Hope. You got to do that. You have to do that, you know. And, and by the way, if uh, I'm not on a suicide mission, if let's say uh, this would never happen, but I'm giving you an example. If can cancer culture got so crazy that for some reason the, the sex with Spenny show was something that was a negative for me, I'd stop doing it. I'd, be, I'd bitch about it be unless there was a, a good reason for it. And I go on to something else, you know, because I have a compulsion to be creative. But, um, you know, you I think you, you need to be like that. Otherwise, you're just stuck with, you know, and, and I and there's there's so much pressure in a not pressure, but there's it's so easy for me to just fall back on the Kenny versus Benny thing and not do the music and, you know, and just tour with Kenny. But, you know, I don't think either of us are built just for that show. You know, it might be the most popular thing we've ever done at the end of the day, but I've I've still got a good, good 10 years left of creativity, you know, I hope. Yeah. Maybe more. No, absolutely. I have, I actually have a recommendation for you. Um, sure. uh, there's a, do you know Wayne Fetterman? He's a comedian actor. He's a, he's, he's a, an author too. He wrote a book, the history of stand-up comedy uh, from yeah. Mark Twain to Dave Chappelle. And just hearing you talk about it, knowing you're a, a big comedy nerd. He was on, he was, yeah. I really he, enjoyed uh, Steve Martin's book, uh, Born Standing, which was, 
just a book about his stand-up career before he got into the movies and everything. It's fantastic cool. because he became one of the first superstar mm-hmm. stand-ups where he was playing arenas, you know? There's some really good info on his career in this book. It, it, the vaudeville and everything made me think uh, that you would enjoy it. So oh, yeah. there you go. That's, well, that's mine to you. Stand-up is something I've done, and I, I, it's probably my biggest regret that I haven't put more time into it. I tend to take that time and put it into my music, which mm-hmm. is probably – economically stupid i would say it's definitely economically stupid but uh you know i love music so much and and stand-up is such a difficult art form you know it really is uh and having done it and you know uh not not done it not particularly well but it just takes years and years to develop the persona to develop the jokes that work and to continually change the jokes because you can't play the same jokes all the time it's a very tough uh, rough and tumble uh, art form, but it's it's wonderful when when it works. Awesome! This, it's been a ton of fun, man. You've given us some great answers. Um, before you take off, let me ask you one more question to sign off on here. The Leafs will win tonight. Yes, and go ahead. The two and one. Let's go! I love it. Um, uh, since the series of the finale of Kenny versus Benny, are right. you and Kenny? Still friends, better friends. Yeah, we're, it, we're on the road together. Well, I mean, the first thing people have to understand is that we both have families. Right? <laughs> we have kids and wives. We don't live in the same city. Uh, so we're not nearly as close as we were in terms of spending time together for that reason. Uh, but, you know, I, I think that the show, uh, unlike our stand-up show where we do argue and bicker, it just took it to a level that made it very difficult The pressure of just having to produce the show and wanting the show to be good mm. uh, was put a lot of strain on the friendship. So to answer your question, I think we're in a pretty good place. Uh, I still drive him crazy. He still drives me crazy. We've done a live stream together. When we tour, we really do enjoy that. Um, we just have to get nasty with each other while we're on stage, which is very easy to do given our track record. But um yeah, I think we're in a very, I think a very good place. I don't know what Perfect. he would say, but he wouldn't, have, you know, that's a funny thing. He would come on your show and, and be very funny mm-hmm. and crack jokes. I don't think I've cracked one joke. I, I, I'm i actually very serious when it comes to these kinds of things, unless there's just an obvious reason to be, you know, uh, to make a joke. Well, that's the, uh, that's the dynamic that's, you know, made that's you guys exactly so successful. Right. That's exactly right. Uh, and I it, couldn't do, by the way, I couldn't do what he does. And I know he couldn't do what I do. So, yep. You know? well, well, if the roles were reversed, the show wouldn't have come off as so authentic and as great I, as it was. I, I think people know that, I, you know, but uh, and it, it was never a competition, oddly enough, with me about who was better or funnier. I just think, you know, where we've taught, talked about pulling the plug on the live shows. And I, I, I think uh, that what we offer as a stand up act and also as a TV show is extremely unique. And as a historian of comedy, I don't really know anything that's quite like us. I mean, Tom Green, who we love and sort of consider him a kind of father figure in terms of the reality comedy genre, he sort of worked alone and did vignettes. And then he sort of got into a talk show type of situation. Uh, Then you've got Jackass, very funny, but there's no story. And they they seem to uh, love doing what they do, where Kenny and I hated it which made it funny, right? We never really liked what we were doing, which, you know, which made the whole thing so funny just to prove that you're better than the other guy. So uh, I just think it's a very, I think it's a unique thing and, uh, uh, and and there's, there's been value in it because of it, I guess. You, uh, you guys have, you know, provided me, my friends, just hours and hours of entertainment. I really appreciate it. Appreciate you coming on and thank you very much, Spencer. Gavin, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure, man. I'll see you on the live. Stay safe. Awesome. Take care.